Okay, so in this part of the lecture, I'm going to introduce the ideas of Marx and Weber and talk about how the basic foundational ideas of what class is developed from you know the 18th century when Marx was writing and from Weber's theories of modernization. So class is a concept for the explanation of inequality. It's not just kind of describing it. It's, it's basically class is a way of understanding how societies systematically reproduce inequality. They're kind of part of how societies work. So, you know, we've looked a little bit at the critical functional kind of um, theoretical traditions. A little bit like the kind of liberal capitalist beliefs, functional sociology tended to say that some measure of inequality was good because of those incentivized things. But really, you know, too much inequality is still bad in the functionalist model. Um, what we're, funct uh, what we're um, focusing on in this lecture is more critical explanations of class um, and the genesis of the ideas around from Marx and, and Weber. Um, and in the third section, I'll be looking at uh, Pierre Bourdieu's work. So Marx, you know, is the, essentially the originator of class analysis um, and argued that essentially how societies work, how capitalist society work, worked, was a struggle between workers and capitalists essentially a two-class system of the working class, the bourgeoisie, and the ruling class, what he called the proletariat. Um, and there's also struggles between workers going on as well in different levels as well that I'll get into a little bit later. The way capitalism functions is it needs constant growth, constant search for new markets, because, of course, it's all about creating what he called surplus value, um, which is, you know, profit for the people that own the means of production. For Marx, the ruling class owns the means of production, the means of production being the factories, the tools, the land, all the things that are needed to create um, production processes. He would argue today, you know, things like um, platforms on, in terms of platform capitalism, capitalism that we were talking about in recent weeks. Um, and this was an exploitative relationship to the working class. Why? Because they need to work more hours than actually for their own work and sustenance to create this kind of surplus value for uh, the ruling class to siphon off. Importantly, um, cheap wages are really important um, to increase competition. Unemployment is kind of good for capitalists. It keeps wages down and makes people work harder and you know keeps them on their toes and precarious. So class is really much here a system. It's not just a description of inequality describes how the mode of production produces these relations. So this is kind of this theory of capital and capitalism. Um, we obviously need to produce things as humans to survive. We need to, you know, produce food to eat and, you know, houses to live in. Um, but Marx saw the kind of industrial revolution, um, you know, really for the first time enabling humans to produce more than they actually needed. And this creates this surplus that... Um, the capitalist, the capitalist class kind of siphons off for their own wealth. So one group of people owns the means of production, um, and they're the, they're the ruling class. The others have nothing but their own labour to sell to survive. Um, these are known as the working class, the proletariat. So the only way really people that don't own the means of production have to survive, the only things they can do, is sell their own labour for a wage to be able to get the things that we need to live that is, you know, food, housing, clothing. So Marx essentially defined these two classes through their relations to the means of production. The capitalists own it, the workers don't. For Marx, this relationship is therefore inherently exploitive, and exploitation is a really key um, social relationship to consider from the Marxist perspective. So in this sense, exploitation refers to the idea that even though workers produce more than they themselves need, the surplus, they do not get to keep this excess, and instead this goes to the capitalists, who then make a profit from the surplus. Now this almost seems like common sense and accepted, I think, um, in society, and Marx argues that's because ideology um, is a thing that's kind of encouraged that to be normal, and we just see that as normal. Marx sees that relationship as being deeply unjust and unfair. Now, the reason this kind of is normal, this ideology, is, again, between the relation between the base and the superstructure. 
there's a kind of, you know, spiralling support system going on to keep the system going. So the base is the means of production, you know, and who owns that. Um, means of production here, again, being tools, machines, factories, land, raw materials, you know, um, uh, and, and computer technology, you would say, today. There's a relation going on in terms of how um, these things develop between the different classes that Marx um, foresaw. Um, so this is the basis kind of the economic system of production. And for, for Marx, everything else in society um, is kind of shaped and maintained by that. Art, family, culture, religion, education, science, politics, media, law, everything not directly to do with production itself is still very much shaped by that system. The profit-driven motive um, and the ways to support this exploitive system tend to then taint all those other things in the superstructure. This produces an ideology, a way of life, a way of thinking what's normal, a way of kind of um, accepting what's happening. And again, that maintains the, the base. So this is kind of spiral pattern. So for, for Marx, this is how this kind of unequal, unfair, unjust system perpetuates itself. So, as I said, Marx proposed a two-class system. He did have some kind of other subtle variations going on in it as well, but um, mostly around the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the ruling class and the working class. The bourgeoisie owned the means of production. You know, and to be clear, they're not the managers. You know, CEOs, in a sense, you know, managers of companies aren't really the ruling class in Marx's conception unless they actually own the properties and, and stuff themselves. Um, but really, I think, you know, this is one thing that kind of maybe a Marxist analysis kind of misses in a sense these days is that those people on, you know, literally hundreds of millions of dollars probably are the ruling class, even if they're not necessarily owning things. Proletariat is everyone else who, you know, has to work for their wages because they have no choice. What Marx essentially called, Marx essentially called wage slaves. In Marx's idea of what would happen, his two-class system, the rich would grow richer. It's definitely happening. And they would um, do this by forcing workers to work for as little as possible for subsistence wages. Now, there's debates about whether that's actually been the case or not, particularly as um, we've looked in previous weeks at consumerism. You know, we have kind of more luxury items and um, things like that than ever before. Um, but there's also an argument that in the last 20 years, with the casualization and precariousness of the labour market happening more and more, that maybe we are kind of returning more to this subsistence model. In terms of what the relations of productions produce um, is the extraction of surplus value, which essentially for Marx is exploitation. So value is produced by labour. Um, the actual living, breathing, working, blood, sweat and tears of people um, you know, doing the work um, is the thing that, it, that produces labour, not, as kind of classical economics puts it, exchange. What happens here is the amount the worker produces um, you know, beyond the subsistence, is surplus value, and this is kind of extracted as profit. And for Marx, this leaves this system also leaves the worker alienated from their own product. So the workers are alienated in this system. Alienation for Marx describes the estrangement of workers from the products of their labour and the subsequent loss of control that is felt by workers under capitalism. Now, when Marx is writing, he's writing about fa things like factories. Um, so where... In a previous mode of production, someone, say, making a chair would, like, you know, get a tree, cut it into wood, make the bits and pieces, glue it all together, you know, make it from start to finish. What happens in a capitalist production system is it becomes automated and someone is probably just in a system, you know, sticking on a ch chair leg, it goes to the next person, they put on the seat, and then, you know, someone then puts on the leather or something. It happens that you become a kind of cog in the machine, in this sense, you're alienated from your own product because you don't get to do the kind of creative thing from start to finish. You're just kind of, you know, sticking something on, you know, putting the wheels on the Model T Ford or, or whatever. To take that metaphor kind of further, you know, um, increasingly um, someone like David Graeber has argued that most people today are in what he called bullshit jobs, where we're kind of stuck doing all this busy work that we kind of know doesn't make any difference and it's kind of stupid, but we kind of have to do it anyway because we need jobs. Um, and particularly in this is a white collar work, and that's a kind of then a different alienation, but um, very still much the same kind of relations. 
So, capitalists extract surplus value. And this is kind of definitely evident in the way that you know we live today. Governments are under constant pressure to keep wages low. You can see the kind of um, constant decimation of workers' rights over the past couple of decades. Um, zero contract hours, the gig economy, and all this kind of stuff now have, have rendered uh, people's working lives increasingly precarious and risky. Um, unions have been um, reduced in their power. Less and less people are members of them. Um, so there's less and less collective bargaining for the working class to look after their own um, needs and, and own desires. Uh, people with full-time work work more hours than ever before, and people without full-time work are working two, three, four jobs to try and get those hours that we need to live today. Um, increasingly, you know, things like um, minimum wages are actually kind of um, not enough to live by as well, and this is particularly the case in the US. Things like technology um, have sped, speed up the pace of work, it's constant pressure, ever-increasing deadlines, um, you know, Fordism, as I was kind of saying before, split things into specific tasks. And increasingly, people are actually being replaced by machines and algorithms and, you know, um, ATMs or um, self-checkout machines at uh, supermarkets. Marx also foresaw what he saw, the growth of the middle class. Um, and most of us don't really believe that we're kind of working class. We're all the proletariat. You know, we own or at least rent homes or have mortgages, have cars shop holidays in this sense, there's a kind of feeling that we're working class, uh, sorry, middle class. But really, you know, from the Marx point of view, those that are earning wages are working class, even if they have more status um, and more things than, you know, people below them in the system. So as recent critics have pointed out, you know, maybe we haven't got um, to the point of subsistence wages and we haven't got to the revolution because maybe capitalism has been uh, progressed by consumer culture. And this is the kind of stuff we looked at in the week on um, culture and the media. We're just rewarded enough from this kind of neo-Marxist point of view to engage with the joys and spectacles of consumption um, rather than kind of, you know, seizing the means of production. Marx argued that what would happen is that inequality and injustice and um, the, the lack of being able to be creative and these kind of things would lead to a class consciousness and this, he argued, would lead to, you know, the working class rising up, seizing the means of production and having some kind of revolution to move what he saw as a communist utopia. Um, he argued that this was necessary um, for people to overthrow capitalism um, and that the, the very kind of situations that um, working class were in, that alienation and exploitation, would inevitably kind of seed the, sow the seeds of capitalism's de demise. Again, you know, engaging critically with this, um, you know, whether class consciousness is actually a thing, um, you know, uh, again, Frankfurt School kind of arguments about how consumer and pop culture distracts us and keeps us separated and individualistic. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of interesting debates about um, whether the class consciousness is actually a thing that exists or not. Importantly, um, despite Marx being really critical his ideas are essentially idealistic. Um, he argued that, you know, while all these kind of injustices and inequalities were happening, that we would eventually move to this kind of, you know, utopia from one way or another. So while, um, while his work is sometimes seen as a failure because communism necessarily hasn't grown around the world and dominated, um, his critique of capitalism seems to be still really relevant in many ways. Um, so... In that sense, like there's kind of, you know, debates about, you know, whether Marx was right or whether Marx considered various things, which has become a bit of a meme in, in some ways. Um, but it's important to consider that he kind of saw societies moving towards a best fit kind of thing for humans to be creative and to kind of relate to each other in non-exploitive way. This is slightly different from Weber, who was writing at the end of Marx and then after Marx and kind of critically developing these ideas in many ways. Uh, Weber argued that, you know, while Marx got a lot of things right and the economic things were really important, Weber started to build a more kind of um, symbolic interactionist view of uh, how classes work, that the stratification of class societies aren't really necessarily completely um, kind of homologous with economics in terms of who has, you know, what, how much money. 
um, that class is also very much made up by people's social status and what he called the relationship to party that I'll talk about in a minute. So Weber kind of developed this idea to think about how status is kind of really important in negotiating what he called the market. The market represents the arena in which people come together as both either buyers and sellers and with the particular resources they possess. So Marx here is kind of opening up an analysis of kind of struggles beyond the ruling and working class, and particularly to show how there's struggles, you know, within the middle class or between the middle and working class. Um, and this is particularly the way that people think about themselves and each other. An individual's class situation will therefore reflect their economic resources, so that's important. And these can be sold in the market to earn rewards, but these also kind of connect to people's uh, status, their the way that you know this, uh, uh, you know, white collar workers seem to be more valuable than blue collar work, and there's kind of various pluses and minuses in terms of your life, in terms of how you relate to those things. So, Weber uh, coins the term life chances, and is kind of interested in thinking about how one's class situation, not necessarily whether you own the means of production or not, but like more kind of granular um, considerations how these affect people's life chances, their opportunities, their possibilities of putting their, you know, dreams or desires into, into practice. So these certainly include things like inheritance of property and business, like, you know, a, a class um, Marx would uh, convey. But there's kind of things beyond this as well, such as skills and education, you know, memberships of different organisations or unions, uh, Weber also kind of pointed out how gender, race, ethnicity and age are kind of factors in people's life chances. And so class becomes a bit more multidimensional here, uh, beyond that kind of singular relationship between the ruling and working and considering other aspects of how inequalities may function. So obviously more than two classes here. Uh, people, therefore, in the system have different market, what he called market situations. The more resources a person has to bargain with in the market, the better their life chances. So for Marx, this has fundamental um, implications for people's access to things like education, wealth, housing, health, and these um, are all related to people's status resources. So Weber starts to de develop the concept of social class, where the um, Marx version was largely an economic class, we now start to bring in these kind of social aspects to think about how um, how to describe how individuals combine their property and marketable skills in the market situation to bargain and gain from these processes to create better life chances. So Weber has this kind of more structured, you know, with more levels of classes. There's the ruling class still up there owning all the stuff, but then there's what he called the intelligentsia, professionals, you know, highly educated white collar workers, professionals such as doctor, lawyers and accountants, the petty bourgeoisie, people that have small businesses such as farms, self-employed, you know, tradies or whatever, shopkeepers, move down into the working class and even there's kind of, you know, levels in that, well-organised occupations that have kind of large unions, miners, skills, trades, stuff like that, and then kind of factory casual workers and unemployed. So Weber kind of sketches out a more complex, multi-layered level of, of class analysis. Importantly, Weber introduces the idea of status. So where Marx is kind of focusing on, on objective material relations, Weber brings in these more subjective kind of cultural elements. Um, and this is a way that different social groups have more honour and prestige, um, and they're thought of as kind of better or worse in, kind of, in a status system. So while status do somewhat correlate with how much money people have, they're not necessarily economically determined. Um, and this kind of moves towards kind of shared lifestyle, shared net networks, the ways that kind of different groups distinguish themselves from others, you know, beyond um, economic characteristics. Status groups, in importantly, can be um, used to include people and exclude people with particular kind of social characteristics that leads certain lifestyles, and this also, you know, moves beyond just kind of money to include things such as race and gender, you know, where people are from, how people have different tastes and morals. So there's kind of different status groups even, in, you know, within 
rich people, right? There's kind of new rich and old money and like people that kind of spend money in the wrong way are seen as vulgar or, or whatever. There's status distinctions within the working class, you know, respectable, hard-working work, working class people as opposed to yobbos and white trash and bogans. And you can see that I've kind of used things like that in terms around the figures of hipsters and bogan in my own work. In contemporary times, um, you know, even some people from relatively privileged backgrounds can go through experiencing poverty, particularly if you kind of move away to study or whatever and, you know, all of a sudden find yourself only being able to afford to eat, you know, packet noodles and stuff like that for a while. This also is interesting when we start thinking about tastes that I'll get into into the work on Bourdieu, that like wealthy people don't necessarily always um, like or consume high status things. Um, so what Weber has done is kind of bring in this more symbolic interactionist understanding of how class works and how it's attached to things like tastes, morals, values and ethics. Weber has also um, coined the term party to think of um, things that people get involved in you know, beyond their work that also have important influences on how power works, how hierarchies um, form, and how status systems um, also form. So the idea of party in this really general sense, it's not necessarily a political party. Party refers to a group of individuals who work together because they have common backgrounds, aims, or interests. So um, these are tend to be movements that aren't necessarily about economic stuff or work per se, um, but they can influence, you know, social st uh, status, status um, stratification, and ideas in this sense can actually come out of these things called parties as well. It's not necessarily the base superstructure thing that, like, everything has an economic um, influence. For Weber, ideas can also flow out of these kind of situations. Um, any, you know, examples of things that kind of match the idea of party would be, you know, feminism and women's movement, um, environmental movements and family first and these kind of things. Um, Weber also was predicting the rise of the middle class in a way, but like more so about bureaucracy. Weber saw that bureaucracies would become the key way that um, society would be organised and this would be rationalistic. Weber believed that Western societies would become increasingly rational and that doesn't just mean more sensible or logical. Weber argued that um, this leads to kind of these dehumanised relationships that kind of take place in institutions and bureaucracies and there's a, a quote there uh, from a couple of quotes there that show how Weber uh, rather eloquently puts that. It's horrible to think that the world would be one day filled with little cogs, little men clinging to little jobs and striving towards bigger ones. And again, note these people um, in the 18th century and early 19th century. So in the, in the 19th century saw you know, humans as men all the time. So there's um, sexist language in this all the time. Um, so basically, you know, the rise of capitalism, the rise of the Enlightenment and kind of science starting to dominate the way that we think about the world um, would mean that bureaucracies are needed to kind of organise an increasingly complex um, array of social situations, scientifically managing large populations. But for Weber, this meant that we would end up living in what he called the iron cage of rationality. He certainly wasn't very optimistic about this, these developments um, and argued that as this kind of rational logic spread, um, we would be trapped in this kind of iron cage. People would be small cog in a ceasingly moving mechanism which prescribes to him an essentially fixed route of march. Weber is essentially arguing here that, um, you know, we've all experienced this kind of dehumanised relationship any time that anyone's ever been to Centrelink, where you get treated as a number, you get kind of treated as a problem, really. Um, in universities, it's increasingly the case as kind of systems get rationalised. You spend less and less time with your lecturers or tutors. Um, and, you know, and, you know, you can see how this is very influential on McDonaldization that we looked at in previous weeks as well. Um, importantly here, you know, Weber didn't see much escape from this. He could see it only kind of getting worse. Again, a quote about, from Weber here about the iron cage of rationality. No one knows who will live in this cage in the future or whether at the end of this tremendous development entirely new prophets will arise or there will be a great rebirth of old ideas and ideals or if neither mechanised petrification embellished with a sort of convulsive self-importance. For those of the last stage of this cultural development, it might well truly be said, he's talking about uh, what people will be, 
will be specialists without spirit, since sensualists without heart, this nullity imagines that it has been attained, civilization never before achieved. What Weber is essentially saying there is that for all the kind of calls of efficiency that um, the way the society organised will um, claim, um, it'll leave us like in this kind of dehumanised um, uh, form of rational relationships with each other that, um, you know, threatens the way that humans think about each other and, and you know, certainly um, leads to things like alienation and stuff that Marx was talking about. Okay, so to conclude, um, comparing these two foundational ideas when it comes to class, Marx was particularly interested in large-scale structures, where Weber kind of tended to focus more on, you know, everyday, you know, symbolic interactions around case studies. Marx sees class as objective, that is, related to the economic and the material. Weber kind of brings in the subjective, you know, related... Like, while the material is important, the subjective elements of class are really important too. So Marx is looking at more the macro level, capitalist modes of production, how ideology functions and, you know, produces capitalist workers. Um, Weber's looking at a more interactional level around individual life chances and their market situations and how different group formations and statuses form around those things. On the one hand, you know, our lives are kind of economically determined from the Marx point of view. How societies produce things is how societies then think. Um, for Weber, the interaction of production and consumption is what matters. So he brings in the consumption side of things here to think about um, class and hierarchies. For Marx, ideology means that people fit the structure. So this is relatively deterministic. Um, for Weber, he brings status to understand the cultural elements and kind of sees notions of party and things like that as possibilities of um, ideas being able to be created that aren't just reproducing the, the economic system. Interestingly, though, um, while Marx is seen as a kind of inherently critical theorist, he sketches a kind of utopian future around communism. Weber, not so much. He sees the future of being much more negative, that we're trapped in the iron cage of rationality. OK, so I'll, um, you know, I've kind of summed up two huge figures of sociology's work there around class, you know, the literally thousands of pages of books, um, and, you know, summarised it quite generally. There's a couple of cartoons there that if you're interested in looking at this further that also do that, but like in a more entertaining way. Um, it's, you know, as you can probably tell, it's impossible to go through the complexity of Marx and Weber's ideas in a, in a small lecture like this. So um, if you are interested in their works, um, there's a lot of support material in the course guide and on the website that you can check out to, to look at that stuff further.